Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good morning and welcome to our online service for Sunday the 22nd of August. Now, you might be wondering where I am. Um, I'm not on holiday. No, unfortunately, I'm back from leave. <laughs> so um, this is actually my living room and I've had to move my office into it as a temporary measure just while my little puppy settles in and doesn't get too wound up if I disappear into um, a hidden room where it's not really safe for her to be. So I'm working from my dining room table at the moment. This week we are continuing with our summer series and we've got the penultimate one. So next week will be the last in our series on the celebration of discipline. But this week we are looking at the discipline of guidance. How do we hear from God? Not just as individuals, but together as a body of Christ, as a church family. What does it mean to value unity above all things? And an interesting and challenging discipline this week to get us thinking about the ways in which we discern together the will of God for our church. Like last week, like every week, there are further resources for reflection and reading and there's a podcast and a video um, that you can access on in the newsletter, details are in the newsletter. And of course, if you want to get hold of the book itself, it's not too late, it's never too late uh, to get stuck into the wisdom that is contained within so, as we gather once more as church family this morning, some will be here online gathering and listening and some will be in church together in the building and others will still be on paper. Let's pause for a moment as one family to bring before God all of those moments in the last week where we wish that we had acted a little bit differently. We come to God as one from whom no secrets are hidden to ask for his forgiveness and peace. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the collect for this week. God of constant mercy, who sent your Son to save us, remind us of your goodness. Increase your grace within us, that our thankfulness may grow through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
The first reading is from Acts, chapter 15, verses 22 to 29. The Council's Letter to Gentile Believers Then the apostles and the elders, with the consent of the whole church, decided to choose men from among their members and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the believers of Gentile origin in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that certain persons who have gone out from us, though with no instructions from us, have said things to disturb you and have unsettled your minds, we have decided unanimously to choose representatives and send them to you, along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So, how do you understand God's guidance in your life? I think that there are lots of ways that God speaks to us personally um, and to me. Um, it, I know that there's not just one way that I, I can guarantee to hear the voice of God on demand. I have to be paying attention and looking around and listening. And all these different ways probably depend quite a lot on our different personalities and our past experiences and the ways that which we make ourselves available to him, the ways in which we listen. Part of the value of this sermon series over the summer has been in looking at different ways of making ourselves available to God, of spending time with him and listening to him. We could talk a lot about different ways that God guides us, but the point that Richard Foster makes in this chapter is that guidance is not just an individual or personal thing. And he has quite deliberately included it here as a corporate discipline. This is something we must do together as the body of Christ. This is not to dismiss, of course, the valuable dimension of God's private guidance to each one of us. But of course, um, it's recognising that it's only one side of the coin and a bit of a neglected side as uh, the contemporary church stands. 
So how does God guide us as a group, as the body, as a family? Well, the Bible has some examples and the most obvious one being when God led the children of Israel out of captivity in Egypt as a people. Everyone in the desert saw the cloud of, uh, saw the big cloud and the pillar of fire and they followed it together. It wasn't just a group of individuals going the same way by coincidence. God was with them in a real and tangible way and they all understood that. However, They soon found that God's unmediated presence was too much for them, too awful, too glorious, and they begged Moses for space. So Moses then became their mediator, the first of the long line of prophets who would bring God's word to the people. This was a step away from the corporate leading of the Holy Spirit, but there was still at this point a sense that the people remained under the rule of God. But the time came when Israel rejected the prophets and asked for a king. Now God did allow this, but it pushed the prophetic ministry to the margins. And through a succession of kings in power and prophets challenging that power, God patiently prepared his people. In the fullness of time, the Lord Jesus came. And with him dawned a new day. Once again, the people could be gathered under the immediate presence of God, hearing from him directly and living in response to that. In our gospel reading, we hear Jesus say, My sheep know my voice. I know them and they follow me. One of the most remarkable things about the early church, the group of people who decided to follow Jesus' example and who believed that his voice could be heard, was that they held a strong conviction and a practice of corporate guidance. Our reading from Acts this morning is the end of a story about one of the toughest decisions the early church had to make. Some believers had gone off to Antioch and had been preaching that in order to become a follower of Jesus, you had to be circumcised. Now, Paul recognised this as contrary to what he had been teaching and essentially It was imposing Jewish cultural standards onto the growing body of the early church. It was a serious issue around identity and legalism. So the appointed elders and the leaders of the church gathered to worship and and to seek the mind of the spirits on this issue. It followed an, an intense debate and passions ran high And the end result was a consensus to reject cultural religion and to hold on to the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. They say it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. In a letter that they wrote to the Gentile believers, the church had faced the toughest issue of the day and discerned God's guidance together about how they should respond together. There was a remarkable unity in that. Now, I wonder uh, if any of this sounds a bit uh, impractical, <laughs> maybe sounds a bit beyond it. How do we um, engage with corporate guidance? Well, I wonder if any of you have a spiritual director. This is a ministry offered by trained people where you can meet with someone on a one-to-one, regular, ongoing basis. It might feel a bit like going to therapy, and in some ways it is, but it's distinct from both psychotherapeutic treatments and counselling. A spiritual director is a long tradition, is also known as a soul friend, comes from the monastic practices. As someone who is present in your life, purely, to help you grow deeper in your relationship with God. A little bit like a relationship coach for you and God. They might help you process experiences or questions that you have about your faith. They might listen as you work through the options when facing a big decision. They might just be accompanying you as you journey forward. Someone to bounce ideas off, someone to help you stop and notice where God is moving in your life. 
And because it's that sort of defined boundaried relationship, the time spent with them means that you can be free and open and honest about where your struggles lie and what your questions are. The ministry of a spiritual director helps you to hear from God in conversation with someone else, to discern together where his guidance might be leading you. As clergy in the Diocese of Oxford, we are expected to have a spiritual director as part of our personal practice. And I found it difficult at first, but I cannot recommend it highly enough to have a space and a person who's asking you those really deep questions about how things really honestly are between you and God has been transformative for my personal spirituality, for my growth in God and for my confidence in ministry. So if it's something that you might be interested in, um, the diocese has a number of trained spiritual directors available to anyone who would like to explore. Um, the, the practice to, to start maybe seeing someone um, and if you have any questions if you, it sounds like something that might be helpful to you or you'd like to explore it further then please do get in touch and I'm really happy to have a chat about what it entails and what it looks like. And before we end it's worth also acknowledging the limitations with corporate guidance the most obvious ones being manipulation and control by charismatic leaders, if not handled correctly, keeping a focus fixed on hearing from God, or if the group loses sight of an all pervasive grace, attempts to bring differing opinions into line using peer pressure can take over and it becomes a way which leaders can impose their own personal will on a group. This cultivates fear and mistrust and people end up feeling trampled or dismissed. We must value and love each other throughout all decision-making processes, even when we disagree, even when we can't find consensus. We must value the people. Other dangers can be to find corporate guidance diverges from biblical norms. Scripture must pervade all sense of guidance from God. He wouldn't go against what he has given us in the Bible. It can be our benchmark the scriptures. Although having said that, we must also be discerning enough to recognise how our own assumptions influence our interpretations of scripture. And just because we see scripture saying one particular thing doesn't actually mean that's the only way it can be understood. Scripture itself is a form of corporate guidance, a way that God speaks to us through the lives and experiences of his gathered people. And we must also recognise that corporate guidance will be limited by our finitude. We are only human, after all, and the best of us will still make mistakes and mishear and misunderstand. Sometimes we simply see things differently, and there's no getting around that. We see this played out between Paul and Barnabas, actually, when they disagreed over taking John Mark with them on their second missionary journey. And this is why it's so important above all things, to sit in the love and grace of God at all times, to draw close to him, to listen to him, to know his voice. Even when we do disagree as humans in relationship, we must seek only God's blessing on each other. Easier said than done sometimes, of course, but that is the way that the spirit will thrive, that we will find that we're hearing from God and that we'll be able to move forward in the power and confidence of knowing that we are being guided by our Lord. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we come to you at times rather weary and disturbed by the unrest across the world both through deliberate evil and natural disaster. But we know that in your perfect, loving and limitless power, there is no need you cannot meet, no enemy you cannot defeat, and no relationship you cannot restore. We thank you and praise you. 
Please help us not to shy away from feeling others' pain, but to be prepared to pray more deeply. Help us never take for granted that in this country, we're able to worship you freely and openly. We especially lift to you Afghanistan. Father, we pray for the Taliban leaders and plead for your Holy Spirit to move in each one, that they question in their hearts and minds before you every directive they issue and every action they sanction, that they seek the peace and work for the true good of the Afghan people. We pray for all those in immediate danger, for the poor, the weak, the very young, the very old, and the disabled. We pray for those working for the safety of others, often at their own expense. Lord, have mercy. We pray for those countries that have been experiencing extreme weather conditions, devastating fires, floods, and landslides. For those who've lost loved ones, their homes, their livelihoods. For those who are struggling with injuries and those who feel defeated. Pray for all those helping in any way with the rebuilding of lives. And we ask for your peace, strength and courage. Father, we pray for our church as we finally approach the installation of a new sound system in early October. We say goodbye to Gillian, our administrator, and begin the process of recruiting for a new person role. And as we welcome Dawn Nichols in September as our children and families worker. We pray for Susie as she leads us, for our church wardens, Leslie and Brian, David, our treasurer, the PCC, for Marion and our pastoral team, for Lorna and the many others who serve and pray faithfully. Help us as a body to continue to discern your way forward and the part each of us is to fulfill. We pray for Eddie and Elizabeth and all their family. We ask that you continue to hold them and sustain them. We lift up to you all those struggling physically or mentally, those living in pain, fear, deprivation, those facing treatment or surgery, those caring for a loved one, those feeling trapped, and those who feel they cannot go on. Father, we ask for the provision of rest, support, a friendly ear, for them to know your Holy Spirit moving. We pray for those grieving the loss of a dearly loved one. Give your comfort and strength as they struggle to come to terms with their loss. We draw our prayers together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen.
And my thanks again to all those who have helped this week, putting together the service for here on screen, in church, welcoming people, um, delivering the paper versions out. And there's so many people behind the scenes. And I know I say it every week, but it's so true. We don't take you for granted. And it's really great to serve together and to, to worship God. Uh, this week on screen we've had uh, Leslie and Michael doing our readings and Cynthia doing our prayers and we are very grateful for the time and effort that you've put into those. Thank you. I hope this week you hear the gentle voice of our loving Father calling out to you to come, to be with him, to rest in him, to listen to how much he loves you and to where he is calling you to and a blessing as we go. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit be among you and those who you love this day and forever. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs>